everyone, welcome to this week's DU teaching on prosthetic mitral valves. So we'll spend about 45 minutes um, today talking mainly through the basics, just recapping that for everyone. We're not going to cover the sort of percutaneous side of things with mitral clips. I think that's a talk in and of itself. And hopefully we can get some of the cardiac anaesthetists to share their knowledge on sort of intraoperative transesophageal echo, which I think is, is most appropriate for a talk on things like mitral clips. Um, but we'll talk to you an, uh, an approach for echo assessment of prosthetic mitral valves. I, I initially thought we could talk about aortic and mitral and then realized, you know, they're both just huge topics. And I think we'll get more out of it just from honing on, in on one and we can do aortic valves at another time. Um, the cases will be a little short. There aren't too many loops and I'm not able to log on to our echo packs um, at the minute because we're merging our systems and things, but um, hopefully they'll still be you know, useful. So recap of the types of mechanical valves, which you'll all be, I'm sure, familiar with, especially the, the bileaflet, which is the one that we see you know, most often. We have the sewing ring, we have the, um, you know, the two leaflets, and this is how it looks on echo. So you get this classic where these leaflets, um, you know, these, these sort of leaflets are, you get this classic sort of ring down artifact from them um, with some acoustic shadowing sort of in between. And that makes it difficult to uh, sort of appreciate the left ventricle with transesophageal echo, um, which is one of the sort of limitations um, of that with, with this type of valve. And we'll talk through the classic um, washing jets that you get with bileaflet valves. They're important to recognize. Um, we need to recognize normal, of course, before we can recognize pathology. Um, and then we see off oh, sometimes, I've seen a few of these single leaflet uh, mechanical valves where you get the, the tilting disc, if you like, um, as you can see in the 2D picture here. And classically, you get this central jet, um, which is a central washing jet that you see with a single leaflet. Um, I've not seen a, a, a patient with a ball and cage um, me mechanical valve. I think they're, you know, pretty much a thing of the past. But I, you know, I think Prof might have a couple of patients with them or something. Have you seen any of them? I have, yeah. No, I had them in uh, wheeled out for my clinical exam practice. And gee, it's a loud, it's a loud sound for physician training. Yeah, you nice. hear this. You can hear it from like well away. Yeah. I bet I can only imagine. Um, all right, so these are the bileaflet valves. I might just play this as I'm talking. So we, you know, this is the, the St. Jude bileaflet valve, which we will be most familiar with, I think. Um, you get these three washing jets, which come out of here, um, and then through the center of the, the valve, and then again at the side as well. And this is, so this is the 2D appearance, which is important to recognize. So you can see both leaflets are opening well. Um, you know, one is not stuck down. You get that, that classic uh, coming together where you see the two ring down artifacts. And that's really what you want to be looking for. Um, and then you'll see these three washing jets coming back. So that, that's a normal bileaflet valve. This would be a single leaflet valve. Um, so this here is the 2D appearance where you have this single tilting disc. So it's important that we know what type of valve we're, we're dealing with, because if this, you know, if you thought this was a person with a, a bileaflet valve, you might think one of the occluder mechanisms is shot for whatever reason. Um, and you can see that very different to the bileaflet in terms of those washing jets. So you get this um, quite broad sort of, you know, almost severe looking sort of central jet with, with these types. And then the ball and cage, as I was saying, we probably won't see many of these now, um, apart from when they're wheeled out for physician exams, um, you know, where you get this, you know, it doesn't look like the others. You have this ball and cage here um, and then you have this central jet as well. But you can see it's not as prominent as, as it is with the with the, the tilting disc valves. And this, I, you know, I guess we see this the most commonly out of all of them, uh, which is the bioprosthetic stented valve. So this is what it looks like. You have the sewing ring and then the bioprosthetic material, which is usually a porcine material. And the important thing is to recognize these struts, which stand quite, you know, quite proud in, into the left atrium. And these struts can 
um, you know, occasionally sort of cause an LVOT obstructions so in the parasternal long axis view, it's important to look for the position and the alignment of that. Um, and then you want to look, you know, to see whether there's any, we'll talk through this, whether there's any rocking of the, of the valve or whether it's well seated, and that's important for all of them. Um, and we'll talk through that a bit more. And then you can see really nice, you know, movement and opening and closing of the, of the tri, and it's tri-leaflet. Um, of the tri-leaflet by a prosthetic valve. Um, this would be an, a normal appearance. You've got this really tiny little, um, you know, valvular regurgitation here. There's no paravalvular leak, which is important. Um, but you, you can appreciate that you don't get the, you know, the, the washing jets that you get with, um, with mechanical valves. There are other types of, of bioprosthetic valves. These are rarely used in the mitral region. Uh, this is an aortic stentless valve. So again, sort of porcine material, you have the sewing ring, but it's not, it's not got that stented kit around it. Um, and these can be sometimes, I think, hard to, to spot until someone you know, writes in the clinical indications that the patient has a valve in. Um, and then just, just for everyone, sort of just to say you've, you've seen them, I guess, because they do occasionally crop up and you think, what's that structure? And then realize it's a, you know, it's a mitra clip. They're quite, they're quite obvious when you see them. They're quite easy to spot on transthoracic echo, which is what this is. Um, you can see it here. And this is the apical views. Um, and seen quite nicely. We'll talk about them another time. So the echo assessment then is going to really use the, the Zogby 2009 guidelines, which I'd recommend you all at least sort of glance over and, and the tables and some of the, um, you know, the videos and the figures that they and the sort of algorithms that they have in there are really useful. Um, but I find this this article and this um, this paper by Laurie Blowett is, I think, more useful for, for sort of day to day clinical practice. And there's some really nice sort of simple algorithms um, for, for all of the valves. And I think the one for mitral valves is particularly nice. And that's one that I'm going to be um, referencing today for the integration of, of all of the findings. Um, suffice to say to everyone in the room, all being clinicians, you know, as opposed to um, echocardiographers, is that we, we absolutely must integrate the clinical information. And the important things to know are, you know, what prosthesis is it? Is it mechanical? Is it bi-prosthetic? You know, is it bi-leaflet, single leaflet? Is it stented or stentless? That's all important information. And how old it is is, is important because that helps you, along with other things, determine if this, you know, if the, for example, if there's action in that valve, whether it's more likely to be a thrombus versus panis formation. Um, and I'll show you some data on that. What the anticoagulation status of the patient is. So the 2020 valvular um, guidelines, I think it's Catherine Otto, who's the main author with um, with a few others, they, they have these lovely sort of algorithms for, for anticoagulation status, which is, is worth just recapping. And for mitral mechanical valves, obviously it's, war, it's warfarin um, with an INR target of three. Um, for bioprosthetic valves, it's, it's warfarin for three to six months with an INR target of 2.5 and then lifelong either aspirin or clopidogrel after that. And um, that those are the most recent guidelines for mitral valves. Um, the onset and the severity of symptoms is obviously important. Um, if you've got someone with a sudden onset of, of heart failure symptoms, that's more likely to be a thrombus, um, as opposed to sort of a more insidious onset where you, you're more likely to think about panis, of course, is going to be overlap with that. Um, and again, you know, sort of things like infective, endocard in, infective endocarditis of prosthetic valves um, in terms of the severity of symptoms, looking for all of those nasty sort of complications with, with fistula formation, abscess formation, valve dehiscence, they're clearly going to have really severe symptoms with that. And, you know, to contextualize your echo findings, we all know that most of the, the Doppler findings, um, particularly things like velocities and gradients are always going to be load dependent. And so contextualizing things in the context of the blood pressure at the time, particularly if you're, you know, you're giving sedatives to do the transesophageal echo, that's going to change you know, the, it might change how you grade the severity, you know, if you're not aware of, of the changes that happen with, with changes to blood pressure. Um, body surface, surface area is important for those at the extremes of, 
of um, size, I guess. Um, you know, what's normal for a six foot man is clearly going to be very different for a four foot five, um, you know, little old lady. And heart rate is important, particularly for the mitral valve. Um, ben, what, what happens with two mitral yeah. gradients with, with tachycardia? Uh, his heart rate goes up, gradient goes up. Nice. Yeah, and that's because you've got less less diastolic that's filling fine, time, yeah. and so that all of that blood just tries to sort of rush through, and you get these higher higher gradients. And this is a key thing. Um, wherever possible, you should always compare your current findings to that fingerprint echo. So, you know, what was the what was the the baseline sort of velocity and gradient through that valve? So, some of the numbers that I'm going to show you are the you know, they're not hard values. They are values that are sort of, a, you know, in a spectrum sort of in the middle of that bell curve. But you're going to have some valves that might have a, you know, the normal velocity of that valve um, peak velocity might be 2.4 meters a second or something. Um, so, you know, not just taking one value um, uh, on its own and, and, and knowing the, the sort of fingerprint for that patient is important. So this is what I was just talking about with in terms of timing, so onset um, of symptoms and severity. Um, this paper here just describes it nicely, and they, they sort of picked out some predictors that are more likely to represent thrombosis. So this is a patient that has a mitral valve with evidence of thrombosis. You can see the, the leaflets look very thickened. Um, and we can't see it moving, of course, it's just a still picture, but there's thickening and it's the thrombus is, is often found on the, the downstream side. Um, uh, you sort of in the LV sort of part of the, um, in it's sort of the facing the atrial part of the, um, you know, of the cavity, the downstream part of the valve. And that's the thrombus there. You can see the sewing ring and the uh, struts uh, sticking up there. And in comparison to a patient with panis, um, where the leaflets themselves don't look too thickened, um, but perhaps you could argue there's some thickening sort of around where the sewing ring is. And that's, you know, the difference between thrombus and, and panis um, from a pathological perspective. Um, and timing is important. So essentially, if you've got if you've got someone that's got a valve that's more than five years old and they're coming in with symptoms of suggesting suggesting obstruction, heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, etc., um, then you know you'd be more likely to think, especially if they'd been compliant with you know their anticoagulation and what have you, um, that this would, would be panis formation. Um, and the you know they predicted you know they showed that uh, more than a fifty percent increase in in the mean gradient within five years is likely to represent some sort of structural failure, um, and this is across the valves. We're just going to focus on mitral today. Um, if the patient's in AF, they're more it's more likely to be a thrombus than than panis formation causing the trouble. Um, of course, patients with subtherapeutic INR, if they're still on, you know if they're they've got metallic valves, they're going to be on warfarin. If they're out of that six month period, they're probably going to be on aspirin. Um, and as I said, that increased increased cusp thickness and reduced mobility on that downstream side um, of the valve is more likely to represent thrombus. Um, so we'll talk through echo assessment. And as always, we're going to start with B mode assessment. And I think this, is, this often gives you um, you know, 90% of the information or something, it's, it's really useful. And we need to spend uh, time interrogating the valves in, in uh, 2D in, um, you know, in lots of different views. And, and we know that we can, you know, because of artifact and things that can be tricky, um, both with TTE, but also with transesophageal. But the things that we're looking for, which I've kind of talked through is the, the motion of the occluders or the leaflets, if it's by prosthetic, um, any, anything attached to the valve or the sewing ring, um, anything that you can see that just doesn't look normal, that's independently mobile, um, that's causing some destruction and, and perhaps regurgitation. We're going to look at the integrity of the sewing ring and the, the annular sort of interface. Um, is it rocking or is it well seated? Um, can you see any obvious sort of gaping holes, um, even with 2D? Um, and I guess just a key point is any abnormal rocking of the prosthesis is, is dehiscence until, you know, proven otherwise. And the big thing you'd be thinking of there would be infective endocarditis in the, in the right clinical context. Um, but it's important that we also look at not just at the, the valve and the apparatus, apparatus, but also at the, the, the sort of upstream and downstream consequences of, of a, you know, of a stenotic or, or regurgitant valve. Um, so I guess for the aortic valve, we'd be looking, you know, LV size function, um, whether there was hypertrophy, 
um, the corresponding um, left atrial size, um, often described as the HbA1c of the heart in terms of that you know, giving you an idea of chronic pressure overload there. And then particularly for mitral valves with mitral stenosis, we absolutely need to know what the pulmonary hemodynamics are doing, whether there's concomitant pulmonary hypertension, as there is in this patient, as you can see, just from eyeballing that, they've clearly got, um, you know, either volume or pressure loading uh, to that right ventricle. Um, and, you know, it's important to know what the tricuspid regurgitant velocity is and, and pulmonary artery systolic pressures and, and things, as well as RV function, which is prognostically important. So I, as again, I sort of mentioned about these blind spots and I guess, you know, the physics of that would be acoustic shadowing. Um, very problematic for mitral prostheses. Um, a bit more than aortic, but, but both have their problems. We'll talk about that another time. But the mitral prosthesis, you get this sort of shadowing artifact. So it's really difficult to see these regurgitant jets in the parasternal long axis view. And it's also difficult to see the, the left atrium as well. You, you can still get good views of the left ventricle with transthoracic, which is one of the benefits of it over transesophageal. And the guidelines actually recommend an integrated approach with transthoracic and transesophageal for that reason. Um, and then in the apical view, we're going to get this, you know, just huge shadowing artifact and it's really difficult to, to pick up any, um, you know, regurgitation, particularly the, you know, the smaller sort of paravalvular leaks um, that would be important. So, you know, in the end, if, if we're concerned about a prosthetic valve, we all, you know, we all have a low threshold to, to perform a transesophageal um, echo. And... Um, there was, uh, as I was saying, there was this um, study that looked at, and this is kind of, you know, the importance of looking at both uh, transesophageal and transthoracic um, pictures, because you don't really, you don't really get a, a good view um, of the LV with transesophageal. And with transthoracic, you can still get pretty good views, you know, especially in the apical view of that, that 2D assessment, that B-mode assessment of the valve. Um, Ben, what do you think of this valve? We'll talk through it a little bit more. Yeah, I can't see any uh, leaflet excursion on that valve. Yeah. And that could be because there's not, uh, although the left ventricle looks to be contracting relatively vigorously. Um, or it could be because uh, there's just artifact because of all the metallic structures there and I can't actually see any motion. Yeah, so this is a patient with a bioprosthetic valve. Um, you can't really see the struts very well, but those you know, the leaflets of that, of this particular valve are completely stuck. Used, yeah. yeah, completely stuck. Um, and we'll talk through, and you see they're going at 108 beats per minute. Yeah. We'll talk through this case a little bit later. But it's just to show that um, I think, you know, sometimes we can jump into transesophageal too quickly, but you can actually get a lot of information still from transthoracic. Um, so the numbers then, so um, as I said, the numbers are not hard values um, and context and comparing to previous is, is important, but a normal peak velocity generally will be less than 1.9 meters per second. And um, there are some, you know, the St. Jude valve, you can, especially if you're looking right through the center of that valve, where you often get flow acceleration right through the center, so you can get higher velocities in the center as, as opposed to the sides of the valve, it can be up to sort of 2.4. Um, and and the, the mean gradient tends to obviously mirror the, the peak velocity. So normal mean gradient would be uh, less than or equal to five. We'll talk through the, the VTI ratio and a few things to, to notice there uh, about that is that the mitral valve VTI is on is the numerator as opposed to when we calculate the you know, the DSI or the DVI, whatever you want to call it, the dimension, the severity index for aortic stenosis, for example, the LVOT VTI measurement is on the top. So just to recognize that when you're calculating that, it's the mitral valve VTI that's on top. And generally, um, that should be less than 2.2, that ratio. And um, effective orifice area of the valve should be greater than, one, uh, greater than two and an indexed area um, of more than 1.2. Uh, which is important for things like patient prosth prosthetic um, mismatch um, to know, you know, to sort of think about it in terms of index area for that particular patient. And pressure half time, I think, is, you know, along with the gradient of velocity, is one of, is the most um, useful value for sort of starting your um, interrogation of the valve, um, of the prosthetic valve. 
so that's normal. Um, and then pathological stenosis would be a peak velocity more than or equal to 2.5, a mean gradient more than 10. These would be, you know, peak your suspicion of something could be, um, you know, significantly wrong with the valve. We'll talk about all of the caveats to that. Um, a VTI ratio of more than 2.5 effective orifice area of less than one. And if you've got someone with a pressure half time of more than 200 milliseconds, um, they're pretty much always, almost always gonna have pathological stenosis. So those are all very scary, very bad numbers. And then we have sort of the ones in between where the guidelines talk about this, you know, um, possible stenosis. And I think probably most of the patients that we come across tend to sort of fall into, you know, bits of each of them and, and, and um, and so I think, you know, taking numbers with the clinical context and the 2D findings, those B mode findings are, are the, are the most, is the most useful. Um, so, so Doppler techniques then. So we've got the numbers there, but we can use color Doppler. And I think color Doppler really comes into its own in helping you, um, you know, sort of determine the direction, the direction of flow. Um, up your spectral Doppler recordings because we all know that Doppler is angle dependent and we're going to completely underestimate if we are um, you know off axis with that isolation beam of flow so that that's really important and color can really help guide that and it can also give you important information you know with regards to regurgitation and stenosis so you can you know if you've got significant regurgitation you're going to see that proximal flow convergence just as it's coming back from the ventricle into the atrium you get that proximal um, sort of PISA, if you like, of coming back. And similar for, for stenosis, you know, if, you're, if you've got colour Doppler over that and you're starting to see a PISA dome form, um, then it just, you know, it, it, it's that sort of um, subjective um, eyeball view that you think something quite serious could be going on with the valve. So it's a good starting point. And then continuous wave uh, Doppler um, through the mitral inflow tract. Um, this is... And I was going to quiz you on because it looks different, doesn't it? When we're used to seeing this mostly um, at the top end because um, we, you know, we, we're more used to doing transthoracic, but this is a, a transesophageal view, which is why it's going down. This is the left atrium and left ventricle. You can see that Pisa dome there coming through, um, and then you know, put continuous wave right through the middle of that of that flow, and we get a profile that looks like this. Um, with the prosthetic closing click. And we can measure pressure half time from the slope of the um, deceleration curve. And then we can measure the VTI, um, just like we do, do with other measurements. Um, and then that will give us, and then we can look at the peak velocities. And this particular patient, this all looks very normal. We've got a pressure half time that's you know less than 130. We've got a peak velocity that's just at 1.9, but the median and the mean gradient is just at five. So you'd want to, of course, interrogate it some more. Um, but this is looking like quite a normal profile for a, for and this is a bileaflet uh, valve. And there's no eight wave there. Yes, nice. So the, the patient is in, um, that's nice to notice as well. Thanks, Ben. So there's no A-wave, so often these patients are in atrial fibrillation. Um, you can spot that from. So why, we've already talked about this, actually. It's not, not meant to point to that. It's meant to point to the heart rate um, being really important to um, contextualise the mean gradient, because if you've got tachycardia, um, it's going to increase the mean gradient. And that's why we can't just, um, you know, use one value. Um, the TVI ratio in this particular patient was 2.3. So you might start to think, is there some um, regurgitation, which we'll, I'll talk through why that might be with that. Um, this is just to contrast a patient. Um, this is still a transesophageal, but the person has flipped the, because you can invert the, the spectral Doppler trace. Um, always remember to flip it back because um, I've done that once where the color and I was like, why is it blue there and, and red there? It's not making sense. And I hadn't flipped, I hadn't reinverted the, the scale. Um, but, it, but this patient, you know, potentially could have a, a problem. So these would fall into that possible stenosis category um, with mean gradients of 10 and pressure half times of more than 130. Um, and so you'd definitely be a bit worried about, about this particular valve. Um, so these are two different patients, both have a mean gradient of nine and a peak velocity of 2.3. 
So the key thing about the gradient and velocity is that, you know, one of these patients does have an obstruction, the other patient is completely normal for them. Um, so it can, the gradients and velocities can alert us to a problem, but they don't necessarily tell us what the problem is. Um, and so we need more information. So causes of a high mean gradient then could be pathological stenosis, and it could be from thrombus or panis, which we showed in the beginning, or from a combination of both of these. Or it could be a functional stenosis, and by that I mean patients, you know, often in the ICU um, where we see higher mean gradients because they're in high flow, hyperdynamic states, tachycardia, um, and there are, you know, cases, I guess we see this less in, in the ICU setting, um, more common for the cardiologist, I suspect, is a patient prosthetic mismatch um, leads to this functional stenosis. And then we can have, of course, pathological regurgitation. So gradients are flow dependent. If you've got a big regurgitant volume going back across that valve, you're going to get a high gradient because of that. And regurgitation can be prosthetic, like through the center of the valve, or, or periprosthetic or paravalvular um, uh, causes of pathological regurgitation. Um, so the other techniques that we use, apart, you know, as well as color Doppler, continuous wave Doppler, and pulse wave Doppler, so that that usual sort of structure of, of assessing any valve is the same for prosthetic valves, is pulse wave Doppler. And the way that we use it in the context of mitral valve prostheses is to work out the um, effective orifice area, and also to work out the TVI ratio. So there's two two um, equations that you you need to have the LVO TVTI. And, um, you know, as, as all of these things, we should be averaging three cycles and, and five, at least five if they're in AF. And this is how we'd calculate the, the VTI ratio. So it's the mitral valve um, VTI over the LVOT VTI. And it would look something I, like Can I just ask a question? Oh. Sorry to interrupt. A couple of times you said TVI ratio and then you said VTI ratio. Sorry. Are they the same thing? They are the same thing. I think the Americans do refer to them a bit as TVI, um, but VTI, TVI, same thing. Yes. It depends you. on what you read, you, you'll see TVI, and then other times you'll see VTI. Um, and the same for aortic stenosis, when sometimes you see DSI, yeah. other times DVI. Um, it's, it's just, yeah, different, different lingo for the same thing. Um, so this would be how you would do it. And I guess just to point out that you're measuring the mitral valve prosthetic VTI with continuous wave, not pulse wave. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that would be that here. So VTI of 42 and then the LVOT VTI of 16. That gives us a, a VTI ratio of 2.6. Um, which is over 2.2, um, and a potential 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 cause for that could be um, pathological regurgitation, where your um, VTI ratio is above 2.2. It's important that you you can imagine this is pretty standard. I don't think you can go too wrong with measuring the VTI of the prosthetic mitral valve as long as your do your Doppler angle is is. Um, you know, sort of bang on, but the LVOT VTI, you can get a lot of discrepancy with that. Um, and there's a nice paper that describes the importance of, and the guidelines even go over this about um, where you put your pulse wave sample. It needs to, whenever you're coming to a, a narrowing through the valve, um, you know, if they've got um, any flow convergence leading up to that valve, you don't want to put your pulse wave Doppler in that flow convergence. It needs to be outside of the flow convergence. Otherwise, you're going to get a bigger number for your LVO TVTI, and that's going to change the ratio, um, which, which could be potentially significant. Um, so then the other thing that you might want to do, particularly if there's discrepancy between for example, the gradients and the pressure half time would be to work out the effective orifice area. And so you work that out by doing this stroke. It's, you can't use the pressure half time like you can in native mitral valves. That's the key thing. Um, and you have to use the continuity equation. So a continuity equation, what goes in must come out. And so the effective orifice area is the stroke volume divided by the VTI of the mitral valve prosthesis. Stroke volume is like we always do, um, LVOT, 
um, diameter uh, times the LVOT VTI, so pi R squared times VTI um, over the VTI of the mechanical prosthesis. And if there's anything less of less than 1.2, that's that's abnormal. Um, and you need to, you know, look for other things. There are other caveats to the effective orifice area, apart from the fact that you have to use a continuity equation, not pressure half time. Um, and that's, as I mentioned, in, in the bi-leaflet valves, the, the, so if you put your cursor through here as opposed to here, um, you're going to get higher velocities. Um, and so you're going to get a bigger number on the, the denominator there and you'll get a smaller, smaller effective airway. orifice area. Yeah. And of course, any continuity equation is not going to be yeah. valid if you've got blood going one way or the other, either through back through the aortic valve or out through into the atria. <laughs> Um, and then, as I said, most of the patients, they, you know, a lot of the patients, they tend to be in atrial fibrillation. And so, so if you're measuring the VTI at one particular cardiac cycle, and then you're measuring your LVOT VTI at a different part of the cycle, um, or in a different cardiac cycle, and those two cycles have very different RR intervals, you're obviously going to get a different um, values. So you need to match the RR intervals, um, you know, when you're measuring the VTI for the mechanical valve versus the, the VTI of the LVOT. So this is then where the rubber meets the road, I guess, and putting, putting all of that together. Um, it, it is quite complicated, but I think this is why I really like this paper by Laurie Blowett, because it really... Yeah, yeah, and it's this. I've stolen this slide from, from the yeah, course, yeah, from um, Steve Lester's talk on the ASC from the ASC course, um, where he kind of, I think it just, you know, sort of puts it, to get, takes this slide from here. Um, and so just to go over this, then start, and that's why the pressure half time can be so useful, and um, because it can uh, immediately allow you to sort of just dichotomize kind of where, where you're at. And, you know, we need to stop and pause if we see a, a pressure half time of more than 130, because that's, it's pretty much, you know, it's always going to be um, a pathological or obstruction, essentially. Um, and if you've got a mean gradient, so pressure half time more than 130, mean gradient of more than eight, um, it's pathological obstruction. If you've got a pressure half time greater than 130, but your mean gradient is, is less than eight, you can still, and this is why the, there's so, you know, so many things to think about with the gradient being flow dependent. Um, and that's why I like the pressure half time, because even if you've got someone with a low gradient, but their pressure half time is greater than 130, they're still likely to have pathological obstruction, but they've got a low flow state because of, I don't know, LV impairment or a small LV cavity or something like that. Um, in those with a pressure half time of less than 130, the recommendation is to then look at this. You'll see now, Kylie, that they they call it the TVI ratio. Um, so, the, so the TVI ratio, it's just the, the VTIs over one another. I don't know why it becomes TVI when you yeah. put one over the other, but anyway, um, if, if that's less than 2.2, then we need to be looking at the indexed um, effective orifice area. So less than less than an indexed orifice area of less than 1.2 um, with a high mean gradient is is suspicious for patient prosthesis mismatch. And obviously we'd need our cardiology colleagues to help us out with that. Um, so, but at least we'd sort of, you know, suspect it from the, from the findings and, and get more sort of specialist advice. And then if you've got a TVI that's less than 2.2 and your indexed area is more than 1.2 centimetres per metre squared um, and your gradient is less than five, then that's likely to be a normal finding. But if you've got a normal area, but you've still got a high gradient and you haven't got a big TVI suggestive of regurgitation, and that's probably because you've got this high flow tachycardia sort of state, um, which I think, you know, we probably see this a fair amount in, in the ICU setting when we have patients with prosthetic mitral valves. Um, and then I really like this one as well. Um, because it takes you immediately down this, this pathway. So if you've got someone with a short pressure half time, but a TVI ratio of greater than or equal to 2.2, and you need to be very suspicious and look very hard for pathological regurg. And if you can't see it on, if these are the numbers that you're getting um, on transthoracic, but you can't see that, that leak, then the patient absolutely needs to have um, a transesophageal echo um, plus or minus other things. 
So prosthetic valve regurgitation, I think just suspecting it is, is the key thing and then looking hard for it. So a high E-wave velocity, a high mean gradient, those are your sort of canary, I guess, in the coal mine that something's potentially wrong with the valve. So there's, they're the numbers that I keep in my head, um, 1.9 and 5. And then, um, you know, if you then look at the pressure half time would be the next thing. If that's less than 130 and you've got a TVI ratio that's more than 2.2, then you'd definitely be suspecting um, valvular regurgitation. And, you know, really the principles for looking at um, prosthetic mitral regurgitation are, are the same principles that we use for native valves. Um, and that's to look at the, you know, the consequences. So always, you know, looking at the LV size, um, etc. Looking at the prosthetic valve, the, the, the B mode appearance of the valve, does it look abnormal or, or normal? Looking at the Doppler parameters, so colour Doppler, continuous wave Doppler, pulmonary venous flow, really important, and, and also for prosthetic valves. Um, so if you've got systolic flow reversal, that's really specific for severe mitral regurg. It's not sensitive at all because you can still have severe regurg and not see any systolic flow reversal because you might not be sampling that particular pulmonary vein. Um, remember, you know, there's four, sometimes more pulmonary veins coming in. There's a lot of anatomical variation. And so you might not be sampling that. But that's a really important thing to look for, particularly with transesophageal, right, where it's really easy to get those uh, pulmonary, well, the left upper is really easy to get. The others can be a bit trickier. Um, and then all the other things that you would normally look for, right? So that large flow convergence, a dense early peaking triangular jet, um, and then trying our best to do quantitative parameters. Um, I must admit, I don't, uh, the vena contractor width, if you have a good view, I quite like that. Um, the rest of them, you just, often we just get really random. I think it's really hard in the, in the critically ill to get these. Um, sometimes I use that easy, easy PISA method, you know, with the radius and, um, and sort of just using the PISA radius, really. Um, so we'll get on to some cases. And for once, I think I'm going to stick to time, which is great. So um, I don't know whether we've got any volunteers that might want to talk through <coughs> the findings. on There's only a few loops, actually, and I apologise for that. Um, so it's an 82-year-old lady I helped look after a couple of years ago. And she presented with uh, dyspnea, hypoxia, and hypotension. And this was her this was her transthoracic echo. If we have any um, uh, volunteers, sorry, Louise, you're on mute. Is that better? Mm. Okay. So as this, so this is a stented by a prosthetic valve. Um, there is not much movement of the leaflets that we can see at all in the two chamber view. Um, I don't know why, see that um, echo density that's flicking close to the yeah. inferior wall. I don't know what that is. I'm not sure it's got independent movement. You'd need yeah. to see it in other views. Yeah, Ben was just um, saying that I think sometimes, well, when they put the valves in, they do like caudal sparing, so they'll, or caudal transection. So I think, I think that's what this ended up being for her, and that's the pap muscles you can see with a bit of flail cord there. Um, so it, it's just the stump of the cord, is it? I, I think so. I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. It looks like that's rather big. It does look quite prominent, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah. Anyway, and looking at the color Doppler, is, is this just a snapshot? Thank you. Okay, there's a very turbulent flow through the valve. Nice. On the four chamber. And I can't see enough of the color box to see if there's any significant regurgitation. Yeah. So that suggests that this is um, likely, if it's going to be a problem, it's a problem with stenosis but I can't really see the yeah, nice. the box. Can I ask, yeah. Um, yeah. just looking at the at the B-mode image, especially that first one you've got for the, the zoomed out view, although I, whilst I can't see it on your colour Doppler, 
are, are you worried about having some left ventricular outflow tract obstruction from that strut? Yeah, that absolutely. Strut yeah, you, you'd be worried about that. It's right? really jutting yeah. in because she's really hyperdynamic. Yeah, and you've got these prominent, which I think are pap muscles and, and cordae, and you'd be absolutely worried about both mid cavity obstruction sure. and and yeah, dynamic LVT yeah. obstruction. Yeah, yeah. And I'm assuming you're going to lose this at least some of the color regression tracing because you've got that bioprosthetic material in there right yeah so you're absolutely so you're going to have acoustic dropout and that affects as we know color doppler as, yeah, as much yeah. as it does um, hey, yeah. and stuff and just to point out as well remember we talked about the um just that eyeball of, of exactly. the pisa so you can see that that pisa forming you know even with the baseline not being shifted down yeah. um you can see that the, they're getting that pisa flow convergence which which suggests it's just an eyeball way to to you know to add add to the sort of i guess overall uh, vibes of, of what you're thinking with the valve but just to yeah, point that out there that's the pisa um, so proximal isovelocity surface area that forms um, towards any narrowing. So Louise, what else would you want from the clinical history to try to figure out what was what was happening? Uh, I'd like to know what valve it was, how long ago it was put in, and presumably if and if blood cultures were done, the results of those. Nice. So Plus, I'd like to know all the other stuff that you find. So left ventricular function, right ventricular function and size and pulmonary, um, the pulmonary pressures. Yes, yes, nice. Um, so just to tell you a bit about that. So she had been very compliant with, um, with uh, her antiplatelets. Um, she had had a few months history of fatigue and, and leg swelling. Um, and she, um, and she had the valve put in about seven years ago. Um, so what are you thinking now based on, on that? So that suggests that she possibly has some problem with the right side with pulmonary hypertension. Um, so yeah. she might well have flow on effect of right ventricular loss of function. Yeah. And she absolutely did, because this was a chronic sort of, you know, clearly a, a pathological obstruction. I'll show you a bit more to, to support that. And um, that was that had chronic. Which antiplatelets was she on? I can't remember, Louise. It was two years ago, but I think it was, you know, it was either as like aspirin or clopidogrel or something. Um, yeah, is the recommendation for both or just for one? Just for one. For one. Yeah, okay. for one. Uh, three to six months of warfarin. Yeah. With an INR of 2.5 for prosthetic valves, uh, bioprosthetic valves, and then um, and then ask lifelong uh, antiplatelets. Um, so just to show you, and, and you're absolutely right, she had subsequent, you know, the upstream effects of everything that was happening with the mitral valve that caused her to have um, essentially severe pulmonary hypertension and core pulmonale. Um, and she was in big trouble, this lady. I just want to point out the, the heart rate mm. there at the bottom as well. Um, I can't see that on my screen. Wow. Yeah. My yeah. laptop's too small. She, she's tachycardic at about 110. Um, Can I ask a question there? So, Lachlan, quick year. Um, in, in the two left loops, you, you can't see any leaflet opening at all. But obviously, obviously, she has inflow. She's not arrested. Yes. And there's, that, there's the LV filling on the right. Is yeah. it the third cusp that's opening and providing all of the flow that you just can't see in the two left-sided loops? Or Yeah, absolutely right, Lachlan. That's really nice. And so that's why things like using the biplane, if you have that function on the TTE, would be useful. And obviously interrogating, because we're all we're seeing here is in the two chamber. Um, and clearly, she does have flow through that. This, you know, It's not yeah. completely occluded. And I'll show you it on the transesophageal that she went on to have. So this is her, this is her continuous wave uh, Doppler trace. Um, ben, what do you think of this? Critique it if you like. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do it? It's perfect. Um, it's perfect. I didn't know I didn't do the trace actually. I did do another one, but not this one. So this is on the trans thoracic before. Hang on, where am I looking? Yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's something else that you can spot on this beautiful Doppler trace. Yeah, no, I mean, the thing that jumps out most <laughs> is this shark teeth in the bottom here. I'll that, mention this second. That mid cavity obstruction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Worried about. Um, mm -hmm. So, you're looking at a continuous wave Doppler through the mitral inflow, nice. the most striking findings um, 
uh, the mean gradient of 38. Um, yes. So what would what, what would we start getting worried about in terms of mean gradient? Who's in what number? Yeah. So greater than 10. Um, or greater than five. five. We start to be yeah. suspicious. Greater than 10. Yeah. More concerned for stenosis. Yeah. Whilst the, the caveat for that is heart rate. Um, heart rate's nice. 106. I would not expect that to be near enough to compensate for such a gradient. Nice. Um, yeah. So it's got a very high mean gradient. The VTI of 104, fine. Uh, and then the other yeah. issue is the um, mid cavitary obstruction. In terms of pressure half time, I don't think you can actually measure that in a way that's of any sort of use no. um, in this trace. I think you can just say it goes on forever. Yeah. It is a, for sure greater than 130. It's, it's greater than 130. It's right, it's greater than 200. Like yeah. it's just, it goes on forever. Right? Yeah, just, there's no place we could yeah. easily draw the line, yeah. I don't think. Yeah, so it's all kind of coming together with what we're seeing on B mode yeah. with, with continuous wave Doppler there. Yeah. Um, a nice spot of the mid cavity. Very nice. Um, and oh, the consequences. Right. I didn't save all the loops actually, but she had some crack in uh, tricuspid regurg. So this is great. I mean, I think that the most striking feature here is a severely dilated right ventricle with features of trabeculations. There's changes consistent with acute core pulmonale, RV to LV ratios, uh, certainly greater than one. There's systolic flattening, systolic and diastolic flattening in the ventricular septum. You can capture that. What I'm assuming is a redundant pap muscle or chordae mm -hmm. now just flicking mm -hmm. into view. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I mean, to be honest, I'm kind of surprised that she's got that pressure so high. So yeah. I would have thought her RV function is not good enough to generate that yeah. pressure. Yeah. Uh, yes. So for now, she's not quite completely dropped the bundle, I guess. Yeah. But it also tells you being that high that it's got it's a chronicity, right? It's chronicity, chronicity there, right? <clears throat> and, yeah. um, and also, can I tell you that her systolic blood pressure at this time was yeah. about 85? <laughs> So she had equalization of pulmonary and systemic pressures. Um, so I guess the question was then, you know, what to do in this elderly yeah. lady um, who, you know, had had a valve in for seven years, is clearly in strife with 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 core pulmonale and, and se severe pathological obstruction of her uh, prosthetic mitral valve. Um, and this is, I, I, um, I think this might demonstrate what you were meaning there. Same patient. Yeah, same patient. Um, so Lachlan, we can see that there is some opening of the of one of the leaflets here, um, but this particular leaflet here is is completely stuck, um, and and you know getting into lots of trouble. So she actually had panis, like yeah. lots of panis sort of formation, and there was lots of sort of vacillation about whether she would go for a, a redo valve, you know, um, or whether they could do um, something else. Blue? So what they ended up doing was they did a a valve in valve. Valve in valve, yeah. Yeah. So, valve valve. yeah, yeah, yeah. So she was actually um, she was put on to she was put on to ECMO. Yeah. And then they did a valve in valve. Um, she would have been one of the first in Australia. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was it was quite novel like mm -hmm. at the time when they're doing it, and um, this is sort of how they they did it. So they you know pierce through the intraatrial yeah. septum. Um, well, these are just some pretty pictures to show. You can see that lovely reverberation artifact yeah. of the, the wire piercing through yes. the intraatrial septum. And then just this is this was after. Post, yeah. Um, you can see that she does have paravalvular sort of leak. Yeah. Um, coming through there, but the flow, they, they certainly got the, they certainly made the obstruction better, um, but there was yeah. still significant abnormalities um, with the valve and she, she didn't do well, this lady. Yeah. Um, and these are just some three, so I mean, 3D is really the, the way to go now for intra-procedural mitral stuff. And I, I'm, hopefully we'll have a cardiac anesthetist come and speak to us about some of the sort of, um, you know, techniques they use. Uh, it's, they're pretty cool but you can see this is the left atrial view so we're looking on fast down onto the mitral valve um i think aortic valve sh conventionally it should be at the top there which i think it is um and then at the 12 o'clock position and then you can see the um you know the, the sort of uh, lead the device going through and then they uh, essentially um place another the valve inside that and then um you can see the regurgitant uh, lesion that we could see just coming back there all yeah. those bubbles coming back um, 
and that's just showing more of the same so i might just oh yeah so just a little um cherry on top quiz what can we see here so this is this is her after the procedure so she's got it looks like left to right flow nice um suggesting that she's at least dropped her right heart pressures uh she's now got left to right flow from you know they've given her a, a reverse pfo or a pfo through perforating the uh nice. septum yeah yeah, yeah 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 so this is a blow off valve for a left heart a fairly normal finding after yeah. these procedures um and there was a bit of question about what to do about that para paravalvular leak um you know whether they could put i don't know like occlusion devices in there or something and then i think the sort of reasoning behind just leaving it is because i mean she was very frail and, and what have you um and chats with her and her, all her family and, and things sort of to guide goals of care but um also the fact that she wasn't hemolyzing too much seemed to be a factor yeah, right. um uh, to not do anything and yeah. so there's this nice paper by Swang et al talking about the 3d sort of side of things from mitral valves um we start you know we we do sort of um play around with this a bit in our lab looking at the mitral valves and um this is a how a, you know the on fast view here um of the mitral a st jude by leaflet mitral valve this is how it would look on 3d you can see opening of the um, nice opening closing of the leaflets there and this is the ventricular aspect so that's how it looks when we flip it and look up from the ventricle um and that's you know the 3d techniques are really the way to go to to mm. assess these for procedural things um and this was really just to point out the importance of the pulmonary venous waveform um so this is a patient that clearly had terrible dehiscence yeah. and leak through there um you can see them coming through but the key thing to look at is the the systolic flow reversal in the left upper pulmonary vein and then they employed a occluder device here and you can see you've, you now haven't got reversal of that s wave and that, that that's what they use um to predict um you know to determine whether the mitra clips working yeah. they they look at the um the mitra the pulmonary venous uh, flow um so second patient I don't know whether you've got any volunteers or Ben, might you want to yeah. uh, talk through this? You've seen this already. Oh, yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So 58 year old man um, presented to our unit a couple, like, with, with cardiogenic shock and he'd been non-compliant with anticoagulation. Yeah, so I'm looking at parasternal long axis views, uh, one with color Doppler, one without, I think it's the same view otherwise, and heart rate of 70. Um, I mean, the most striking, there's, there's multiple concerning features on this study, the most striking of which is what appears to be the um, lack of motion of the prostate mud valve in conjunction with uh, severe or conjunction with some mitral regurgitation. And on the color Doppler, the concern here is whether there's potentially a um, ventricular septal defect from where that variance is or not. I'd be I'm very worried about the gradient across that mitral valve. Left ventricular function looks sluggish and the RV looks dilated. Nice, Ben. For, I know Sam's on now, so we're going to do some questions. I'm finished, Sam. I thought I'd done so well sticking to time. I have gone over a little bit. Sorry. Um, yeah, it's a ni nice, Ben. Just to point out again the, the things. Remember that strut that we talked yeah. about hitting the LVOT? So you'd be worried so about whether there's going to be obstruction there. But obstruction. even though it's a transthoracic and we're getting a bit of dropout, you can see that those, you know, the leaflets are really not moving uh, particularly well. We've got, we've got flow convergence. Nice, yeah. We've got the PISA forming, you know, suggesting a significance to know is coming into that and we've got hugely turbulent flow mm. and and we are getting a suggestion that there is some regurgitation as well which in fact there was there was quite significant regurgitation on the um transesophageal and then again looking for that you know the consequence of, of what's happening with the mitral stenosis a similar sort of finding with the last patient mm. with septal flattening and systole and diastole and, and core pulmonale this patient's even been so bad that they've developed a so pericardial effusion as well um, and again just showing the um you know that pisa doming that that turbulent flow going through and we can see that regurgitant jet uh, coming back through there as well um 
And ag go. again, just to um, demonstrate, you know, the, the pressure half time, that magic number of more than 130 is clearly way above that. Yeah. You know, you can almost Same diagnose it just looking at this one spectral Doppler trace. Um, and then we've got mean gradients of 16. Um, and I just wanted to ask if we could rely on his on the TVI ratio um, for this patient. And if if not, why? Um, I would um, I can't see where it depends on the number is. Um, I would say no off the top of my head though. Why? And the reason I said no off the top of my head is because of you know, what we're looking at is in my mind, and correct me if I'm wrong, don't have up, uh, is what we're comparing is the amount of flow across the mitral valve into left ventricle to the amount of blood that's leaving the left ventricle, um, which should be going out the LVOT. Um, but in this case, he's got mitral regurgitation. Lovely. So Very we can't nice. do that comparison fairly. So Very it's nice. not a valid test in this patient. Very nice. All right. And that con, oh, we'll, we'll leave it there, guys. There was another patient, but for time, we'll, we'll hand over to Sam. Uh, thanks very much for joining. I might stop the uh, recording there. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emma. Thanks, Louise. If you learned something, hit like and subscribe to our channel for more videos uploaded weekly. For bite-sized versions, follow us on Twitter at Echo Nepean and check out the tutorials. Or head over to our websites for the latest hands-on courses. Links in the channel banner. And thanks, thanks for, for watching. watching.